right, we're going to go over the last chapter of the book that we're going to cover today, chapter 14. But before we do, I got this thing, I guess it was a while back, but from Kerry Freilich Mueller, who's Ed Robinson is the vice president of student services, but Kerry kind of runs everything. So it says, I am seeking your help to get the word out to students about applying to graduate. If you could let your students know that if they're planning on completing their coursework in May, they need to apply to graduate by March 1st. I know some of you already have. If you plan on completing in July or August and you want to participate in the commencement, then you must apply to graduate by March 1st. And I believe, you'd have to check with them, but I believe that the rules are too. Um, I think that if you're like one or two classes away, then you can still go through the line. All right, so. If you're interested in that, that's fine. No, you're supposed to apply for graduation anyway. That makes sure that they get all the paperwork done as far as your uh, diploma and, and making sure everything in banner is up to date, et cetera. Right. Yeah, there's a thing out here, graduation. And, you know, if you go out to, to Blackhawk, there is a link out there for graduation, and they mention uh, you must complete a graduation app using the portal. If you want a duplicate diploma, learn how to print your transcripts and a complete graduation audit, the official thing about graduation, the formal ceremony, etc. I haven't read any of it. But also, just so you know, tomorrow, from 11 to 1.30 and 4 to 6, and Thursday from 11 to 1.30 are grad fair days. All right, and there are signs around. I mean, I can click on this. Central Campus Room 2100. Okay, so that's someplace down near the bookstore. I'm not sure exactly where, but it's down near there. All right. Now, do you have to go to that? No, but as it says, you can order your cap and gown if you want. If you do want any graduation photo, announcements, rings, this is a good thing to do. Sign up for career and professional services. If you haven't done that already, get your name on there because what will happen if you don't know this is if you are going to graduate in May, you, you get to keep your email for, for nine months, all right, 270 days. And um, they'll send... You know, it, once you get on there, they'll send any job listings, you know, IT-related job listings, et cetera, will be sent to you automatically if you sign up for that. Notice also, if you care, the graduation ceremony will be on Saturday, May 16th at 1130, and you have to be there by 1030, all right? And there's a rehearsal, and you have to come to the rehearsal. So if you plan on graduating, there's, they're, they're literally, they set this up uh, like two years ago. That literally, if you don't come to the rehearsal, they will try to make sure you don't, you aren't allowed to walk in the line. They have stopped people from doing it before. The rehearsal is typically about two hours, and when they've done it in the past, they've had like free pizza and stuff afterwards to try to entice people to go there. All right, and if you don't know where the Dream Center is, it's right down the road from one of those car dealers that's right off. Not far from the expressway, but, you know, if you were going from here and you were going to take, uh, you were going to take Cranston, let's say, to the expressway, instead of making a left to go towards 43, you make a right type of thing. It's not hard. You need to know. There's the address. It's at 2460 Milwaukee Road. There'll be all sorts of instructions and stuff before then also. It last year was the fastest they've ever had it. Literally, I think they finished it in 48 minutes. Yes, the entire graduation. So what I'm telling you is it started right after 11.30 and it was done before 12.30. No, they had never done it that fast before. I will tell you the person who gave the commencement speech, the um, was some, they always have some person from the legislature, was good, but they were very, they were short. Boom, that made it really nice. Plus from last year, from what I heard, there were somewhere I, I, this is the number I was given. I was like 550 people on the program, and out of there, I think maybe half walked through it. All right? But if you are planning on going, you should be doing all that stuff now. Okay? And if you don't care, that's fine. And I just took up a few minutes of your life. 
Windows 10 will let you say goodbye to passwords forever. Microsoft adding password-free sign-on via Windows 10 to Azure Active Directory Cloud Apps. So some of the apps in Windows 10, you will no longer need a password. And they're saying that's basically good news and bad news. It's good news because if you're the kind of person who forgets a password, and depending on how it's set up in your IT, that's a good thing. It's bad news in, in that is that going to make it easier for people to crack and get into things they shouldn't get into. We'll see as we, as we you know, go through this. All right. I don't, I don't doubt anything. And if you talk to, to somebody like Doug Tabbitt, he'll tell you that he believes at least 50% of all computers that are running on people's homes that are hooked up on the internet are zombies. In other words, there is somebody already, someone in control of them. All right, you clicked, you clicked something at one time or you did something at one time. If you don't know where the zombie thing came from, is you actually can sign up with, with different companies that use super, supercomputers and the like that says that, that basically if you're not using your computer, if it's on and you're not using it, they can grab some cycles and do some work with it. All right, don't want to go into it any more than that. All right, so... Yes. Yeah, it's not all bad. I don't mean to. I don't mean at all to say that it is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's always good to know. All right. Um, if you do go out to the P drive for the class, you don't have to do this. We're, there's. There's three or four basic things that are discussed in this last chapter. And again, my goal is to be done with this by 11 o'clock. All right, but if you do go there, the, the CH14 folder, as far as I know, the stuff that's in there works. Now, you're not going to be able to run it directly. This is on testing and debugging. All right, so there's all sorts of stuff that you have to do if you want this stuff to be able to work. I've done it. So I'll go over with you what I did to try to get this stuff to work. All right. I loaded a few things. Some stuff was already on there already, but um, it was not basically turned on. I turned it on. And so what I want to do is just go through the stuff with you that's in the chapter. All right, the chapter itself is approximately 20 pages, a little more than 20 pages long. So the author says, to conclude the book, I want to discuss three concepts with you that you'll likely want to do as you go forward. The first is debugging tools. And you could actually make the case and say, well, gee, wouldn't that have been a good thing to put in the first chapter? Well, using the debugging tools in PHP, by and large, isn't all that easy. And he even mentions in there it's a two-edged sword. You need debugging tools when you're starting to learn the language, but when you're starting to learn the language, you know the least there is to know about debugging. All right? So he talks about that first. Bless you. Bless you. Then he goes into unit testing, and he talks about different ways of doing design unit testing, all right? From there, he goes on to try to make your program run faster. So he talks about profiling and performance enhancing. I'm going to show you all those, except I've been having some problems with the profile enhancing. But the rest of it, all the stuff that's in here, I'll show you what I did, all right? <clears throat> Again, if you care, and, and I'm telling you this, if you don't care, hey, you don't care. But if also, if you do care, You know, in, the, in that in-class folder for today, not only is there the CH14 stuff, and you notice there's not many scripts in there, but there's also a thing I called articles, where I, I got a bunch of information. All right. In this chapter, among other things, um, the author talks about using xdebug. So you notice I've got a few things in there for xdebug. All right. He also talks about unit testing. <coughs> So I've got some stuff in there about unit testing. He also talks a little bit about test design debugging. <coughs> we'll talk about that. And some of the stuff that's in here, again, I tried to find some articles I thought were relevant. So they're out there if you care. If you don't care, you don't care. <coughs> Hopefully you all can hear this. I'm battling a cold. 
Uh, I thought I was winning up until yesterday, but also find out just how bad DayQuil tastes if you've never drank that stuff. I just can't stand that. Yes, it does. Not, it's not as bad if you if you hold your nose while you drink it, but then you can feel it inside, you know, and you can kind of sense that smell. So that was interesting. All right. So, Almond mentions three of his favorite debuggers in here, and that's Advanced PHP Debugger, and he shows you where you can get that, DBG, which is another PHP debugger, and Xdebug. Now, you may or may not be aware of this, but Xdebug is already installed under XAMPP. That's the good news. The bad news is, even though it is there, even though it's installed under XAMPP, let's see if I still have that open. No, of course not. <coughs> You've got to go into your php.ini file, your ini file, and remember that anything that's in here that starts with a semicolon means that it's commented out. So you notice if I remove the semicolon, you see what happens. All right? And there is something that's way down near the bottom, and I'm, I'll probably put the wrong thing, but we'll see. So you can see how much of the stuff in here are comments. Those are all things, again, that you can turn on. And how much of the stuff in here is actually turned on. All right? I know it was right down near the bottom here. And I know that when I searched for it, it didn't come up. I don't know why, but it didn't. But there was a line in here someplace, like I said, and it's right down here someplace near the bottom, that... Um, I was able to turn the debugging back on. That's not it. Right there. You know, do you know what a DLL file is? Do you know what DLL stands for? It's a dyna dynamic link library file. It's basically an executable that you can use. And the X debug is right there. It's always been there. It should be right there under your XAMPP PHP EXT folder that you have under XAMPP. The point is, by default, yours all look like this. And so did mine, meaning that it was turned off. Now it's turned on. That's all you literally have to do to turn it on. You save, and then you have to get out of XAMPP and start it up again for the change to take place. All right, so that's one of the first things he says. A little later in here, he'll talk about working with the profiler, and I want you to see that, so I'm going to run some stuff later to show you what happens when you do that. But as you can see, with almost 2,100 lines in here, there's a boatload of stuff. And as already mentioned, if you peruse your way through here, there's a lot more stuff that's turned off in here than there is turned on. So again, he goes through and he talks about installing Xdebug on Linux and Mac. We don't need to know that. All right, and he says, run the PHP info script to see if it's already turned on. It wasn't turned on. All right, so I went in and I checked where it was in the ini file to see if it was there. It was there. So you don't have to do this, which says go out to xdebug.org and download it because you already have it. And you don't have to move that because it's already there. So I went right from step two to step five, where, as it says, we had to find out where it was, and I had to enable that line. That was the same line that I just showed you. All right? And it says save it and restart it. If you rerun P, you know, um, PHP info, you should see then that it's turned on. Okay? And that's all fine and dandy, but what the heck does that buy you? Well, I want to go back, and back in Chapter 9, there was a script that was called iterator.php. 
All right, you may or may not remember it. It probably didn't stand out for a lot of reasons. It wasn't like, oh my gosh, is that ever cool type of thing. It wasn't that at all. Let me see, make sure this is running. It is. But if you remember back from chapter, back from chapter 9, when we ran this, This was the iterator. And why it's that slow? I got a lot of stuff open. And that's probably why. So this is the chapter we went over before. I think it's. Oh, I think it was a mistake in the book. I think it's chapter eight. It is chapter 8, and it's in that one. There's iterator, okay? So you ran it. Remember this? doesn't look, you know, who cares, right? John Doe and Jane Doe have been added by the Human Resource Department. Okay, that's all fine and dandy, all right? Then let's fast forward. We're taking the same script, the same exact script, and I added xdebug to it to show you what you can get by doing that. So what we did, what I told the system to do here, was to dump all of the super globals. Now, if you look up on the screen here, can you see where this might help when you're debugging, when you're looking for different things? All right. So if you needed to know exactly the name of your server to double check it, or you needed to, you know, the, the port you were running on, or whatever. All right. And then I came in. And I put a mistake into the script, and I ran the same stuff again. Okay, so I want to show you, literally, this hardly took any code. And I turned everything on. You don't have to turn all this stuff on. I turned on all the super globals. But I want to show you what I did in order to get this to show. the exact same script we had before, all right, other than a few things were added to it. First one, right there. I had to tell it in my any file I wanted it to do a dump all of the server variables. That gave me all that stuff that you saw at the top of the screen, okay? And after I did that, Literally, the command to do it was xdebug dump super globals. That's it. Then I put in an error, all right, and I kind of told it to do it again. Now, I want to show you one thing because, you know, I, I saw some people making faces like, I would never want to use that. Well, never say never. But I'm going to take this and I'm going to comment it out, all right? And the reason that I'm taking it and I'm commenting it out I'm going to do all this stuff where I introduce the error. All right, so I'm taking all this stuff. And all I want to show you is just this code right there. We've used var dump before. You may or may not remember it, but we've used it before. All right, so just doing that by setting up the debugger and just doing that. Okay, so again, you've already seen this, but I want to show it to you one more time. I think it bears repeating. So if I show you this one, this is from Chapter 8. Okay, but oh, well, that's the after picture, not the before picture. So this script 8.9, this iterator, that's all that's in there. All right, but if we go back and we rerun it, 
as this, notice what the difference is. I mean, just using something as simple as var dump, what this has done is rather than just saying Jane Doe and John Doe have been added, it shows you everything that's been added. All right. So this is a way, as you're going through a loop, that you can go in and say, oh, okay. All right. So the name was human resources. Bless you. All right. And we've got employees in here. The, the employee's name was Jane Doe. All right. The other employee's name was John Doe, et cetera. So you can peruse your way through using this stuff. And that's kind of what the author was talking about in this part of the book. All right. So he runs through the same stuff that I just showed you. Then he dumped all the server variables, and I showed you that also. So that stuff is in there. Then he also mentions, the, you know, he says you can put undefined stuff in there. All right, and he puts an error in there, and you can even customize Xdebug, and he shows you this on page 458. You can read that on your own. When he says that you can customize it, he doesn't mean, oh, you might want a pretty pink background. No, he means that you can funnel out what you want to see and what you don't want to see. All right. So there's some cool stuff. Again, that's me speaking. You might think, no, that's just some scary stuff. All right. Okay. So, unit testing. If you go to work for a company where you are one of many programmers and you're working on a project, all right, so let's assume that we had a program depar programming department that had 25 people in it, okay? And these 25 people were broke, broke up into five groups of five. And each group of five was working on a component for a project. Does that make sense? It's not really all that out of the ordinary either. All right? Then typically what each group does is they've got a unit of the project that they're working on. All right? And the idea is while they're working on the project, they have to test the hell out of their unit. And eventually you have to bring those units together and make sure that not only do they work individually, but they work collectively when you bring them together. Right? And it depends on are you creating something new or are you modifying something that's existing? Because if you're creating something new, it's actually a little better because if you're modifying something that's existing, not only does your stuff have to work and work together and work separately, but you can't break anything that's already there. So that's what he talks about in here. And he talks about why you test. Testing will ideally minimize bugs. It'll help you improve your design. It'll assist in creating documentation for your code. The first document that I ever created when I was at AT&T was I had to do a design unit test document. I had approximately 500 different tests I had to run on my code. So I had to take, for each one of those 500 tests, I had to write a little prologue. This is what I'm doing. This is what I expect. This is the test. Then I had to run the test and afterwards say whether or not it worked. So the first document that I created was over 500 pages long. And it became part of their official documentation. All right. All right. You're less likely to break code and introduce errors as you make changes down the line. Okay, it says learning how to implement unit testing involves both syntax and theory, and the author talks about both. I don't want to read to you. But the idea is you're trying to make sure your stuff works as well as possible, both individually and collectively with every other part of the project. And that's what he's talking about in here. All right? <coughs> now, he mentions that one of the most popular PHP design unit testing, that the things that are available, is PHP unit. All right, so if I go out to here, It's phpunit.de, okay? And he goes through in the book, and he talks about when you're doing all this stuff, basically what you have to do. All right, so literally, you know, if I wanted the most stable release, I could go to here, I could save it out to my PHP directory, etc. And as we go through this, I'll show you what I did in order to do that. 
So, so far he has talked about xdebug, and now he's getting into PHP unit. Before he does, he says, hey, just so you know, there's another thing that's called test-driven development, TDD, that's kind of the opposite of what he just talked about. This sounds a little bizarre when you hear this, all right? But a lot of firms do this now. When you've got test unit development, what you do is you write your tests first, then you write the code to make the tests work. And when you think about that, it might sound a little ass backwards. Because, I mean, think about it when you're in class here. I don't typically give you a test and then, and then teach you the material. You normally taught the material, then you do the test. All right? But the author mentions that when you do this TDD, as it says, you won't write, end up writing tests to match the code. All right? It says, besides, unit testing does this. You have targets to shoot for. So TDD is related to the concept of extreme programming. If you've never heard of extreme programming, it's got a lot of things involved in it. One is that pair programming that we talked about earlier, P-A-I-R, where you've got two people who work together for one to two weeks, and typically one day the first person just inputs stuff into the computer and the second person tells them what to input. Then they trade off every day. Now, there's, there are all sorts of different variants of that, all right? But that's one thing. The other thing with extreme programming, I, I'll always remember this. The first project I was ever involved with at at and it was on CSS, which stands for Common Channel Signaling, not Cascading Style Sheets or, well, that's CSS, but it was CS, CS, Common Channel Signaling, CCS, all right? And we had this big timeline. It was about as long as this wall right here that said how long everything was going to take. And I remember because the, the end dates were all 84. And Ken Paker, who was a friend of mine, who was our project leader, walked up onto the timeline as we were into it about a month, and he took all those fours and he put an X in them and he made them into fives. And we said, what are you doing? He said, we're going we're gonna to miss our goal by a year. We're going to do it and it's going to be really good, but it's going to take a year longer than they think. And I said, why? And he said, basically, because I've been working with these nitwits who are out in New Jersey that we have to work with, and they're all fumbling idiots. And it's going to take that long before they understand what we have to do. He was almost dead on. All right? That doesn't cut it today. With extreme programming, what you do is instead of having one project with this one big goal, you'll typically take your project and break it up maybe into 10, 20, 30 mini projects. And each one of them have a timeline uh, quite often of one to two weeks. So this testing and writing tests and being as prepared as you can, as quickly as you can, becomes much more important. All right. So. A lot of people hate that because I've heard IT people tell me the last thing in the world I want to do is be around other people. I got into IT because I want to be stuck in a room by myself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And meetings aren't fun either. All right. You know, it was such a difference when I went, for example, from AT&T, which was just meetings galore, to Woodward Governor, where I never met, you know, other than the fact that they flew me out every other month out to Colorado to meet with people I was working on a project with. Other than that, I was just in, literally in a bad room with really bad artificial lighting in a basement all the time. It was kind of, you know, for, some, for some people, it would have been the programmer's, you know, ecstasy. I didn't like it because the lighting was that bad, all right? And I never really saw anybody. I was kind of stuck off in a corner. But some people like that. So they say they're to install PHP unit, okay? Just so you know, the steps they put in the book here didn't all work exactly as planned says, access your computer via a command line interface, you know, from a DOS command window. All right. Then what you have to do where they say step two where it says pair upgrade minus all, I had to go to the C drive, change to my XAMPP PHP folder, and then type in that command. And when I did that, it was not a short process. You saw a lot of this stuff, but it took about 10 minutes before everything upgraded. What it did was it basically, for lack of better words, 
it went out to the internet and it compared to what, what I had to what the current version was and if it was fine it just kept going and if it wasn't it downloaded the new one that makes sense all right then on the next page they say well then the next thing you have to do is install PHP unit well I followed all their steps and it didn't work for diddly really it, it was just a cluster so I went online and I took what I, what I found out on Stack Overflow and I put that out there on those, under that articles directory. So what one of these Stack Overflow articles said, so I, I basically Googled the problem I was having and the error I was having, and somebody had almost the exact same error. And one guy came back and said, don't follow the manual, don't follow the book, go online and download Windows Composer, and then once you've got Composer, save it to your C drive and just type in the command Composer space global space require space and then in double quotes PHP unit slash PHP unit equal 4.1 dot star double quote. I put that in, work like a champ. Not a problem. All right. And then once you've done that, you can start writing tests. So the next several pages, and you'll notice this here on page 462 that we're on, on the right-hand side, it says unit tests are defined using assertions. Now, I don't disagree with what the author says there. An assertion is a programming concept that says confirm that this is the case. We use assertions all the time. If somebody tells you something and you look them in the eye and say prove it, you're basically asserting. You're asking them to assert that they can prove that indeed it works. All right? And if you go out and you look up, I, I didn't put the URL or anything on there, but it's right in the PHP manual, there probably are, I'd say, somewhere between five and ten times as many assertions as you see right here. And you can put all sorts of assertions into your code. When you put the assertions into your code, you may or may not be able to see this. All right? See those periods right here and right here? That's how many assertions you have. And if they all work, you get a period, which means that they were true. And if they were false, that means what? They didn't work, so you're going to get an error message. Okay? Now, that may or may not make sense, but I'm going to show you an example of it in just a second. All right? So he gives you some examples, but they're, they're so ambiguous almost in nature. This would say that haystack contains needle. That's an assert contains. This, would, this is an assertion basically as it says. It says this is the equivalent of saying, okay, you've got an array called haystack and you're looking for something called needle. If it's in array, echo, you know, or if it's not in the array, rather, echo that the test failed. So you can check for anything. What you want to do when you're doing this design unit testing, okay, is you want to guarantee that, number one, everything that you want to have happen happens, and number two, not if, but when things fail, that your program handles it correctly. Okay? I've given this example before. Maybe you've heard it. Probably you haven't. Sorry. But I'll always remember this because when I started at AT&T, this was one of the first things they taught us. All right? We talked about a switch statement. And you're switching on X. I don't care what X is. And you've got case, you know, one, you do some stuff and you break and you've got case two, and you do some stuff, and you break. And you've got case three, and you do some stuff, and you break. Well, that's how somebody had written their code. Can you see right now what's not there? There's no default. Okay, and again, you may have heard me say this before. What this did was this blew up a switching system right outside of New York the Friday before Mother's Day. And if you don't know, that's the biggest time for, especially guys. You know, we all feel guilty. We don't call mom enough. Yes, that was, I mean, this was back 30 years ago. Okay, 30 years ago. They figured they lost $5 million in revenue over that weekend. Now, put that into today's money. Probably is worth 10 times that. And the reason was, all the guy had to do was at the bottom type in default break. If he would have done that, 
it would have just broke out of it. But since it didn't, it was in this loop, and there was no way for it to get out. It kept running in there contiguously. All right. So that person had never tested, no, it wasn't me, but that person had never tested to see what would happen if that happened. No, from what I heard, they didn't fire the person. I mean, he had very good rationale, for, and it was a good programmer. It was an oversight. All right. So they go through a lot of different things, and running test cases, and, and a lot of other stuff. So what, what the author does here on page 464 is he goes back and he says, hey, let's go back and try something real simple. Okay, so let's go back and try a test on a rectangle. Now, you may or may not remember, but if the width is 8 and the height is 9 and you want to figure out the area, 8 times 9 is 72. So we're doing an assertion here to make sure, indeed, that works. That makes sense, right? I mean, hopefully, at least, it makes sense. So if I come through here and I come back to here, and now I have to go and literally bring up a uh, command prompt window, change to the C drive, I'm doing that right now, change to XAMP, all right, change to uh, htdocs, and change to ch14, all right, all right, so now I've got, I'm going to go one more, I want to go to C, cd to script, 1403. All right, and I do a DIR there. There's what I have. Okay? Now, if I try to run the test from here, so in other words, if I come here and I go, oh, 143. Oh, there's my test. It doesn't know what to do because it's trying to run the PHP unit test work, but it's not meant to be run. From a uh, from a browser, it's meant to be run from a command line. All right. So if I run that same test, so all I have to do here is say, PHP unit rectangle test. I don't even need to say the dot PHP. See how it worked? All right. See the dots there? Now I, I don't expect you to go. Oh my God! What? How fantastic! But just so you have seen it. Now, and the reason I'm showing you that is I'm going to come in here. As this is what's in here. So we got some tests. 8 times 9 is 72. All right, checking the perimeter, checking a bunch of other stuff in here. So that's our test. All right, but I want to come in here and look at the rectangle. Because in the rectangle, when we create the rectangle, this is where we're coming in and we're checking everything. So what we're trying to do in here is we're trying to make sure that the size, the area, the perimeter, <coughs> all that stuff, we can write assertions for all that in here. Okay? Well, that one you know already know works, but what if I do this? I'm going to grab that line. And instead of 72, I'm going to set it equal to 73. I'm purposely putting something wrong in there. Now it tells me that there was an error. All right, this is kind of a crude tool as you get, as you could probably get it. But when you go through it, all right, as you go through it, you can write your tests as many as you want, as simple as you want. You can run tons of them at one time. All right, that's pretty much what he talks about in this particular section that we're in right here. So he talks about how to create the test case. I already showed you the 8 times 9. I made the change in here so you could see what was going on. All right. 
typically what you do, as they mentioned, is you put a whole bunch of tests together that belong together. And that's typically, that's referred to as a test suite. You run them individually, and once you're happy with the way they're working, you run the suite collectively. There might be hundreds of tests, and they should all work. Right? If that's the way that you've designed them, designed them to work well. So like I said, it was interesting. It was most of my afternoon yesterday was spent just playing around with this stuff because it had been a while since I'd looked at any of it. And this was the one I went into and changed it from 72 to 73. All right, two more things that he discusses in the chapter, and then we're finished with the book. The first one talks about profiling. Now, it's kind of important that you read this, at least that you've heard this. It says, profiling is the process of analyzing a script to see where there may be performance bottlenecks, slow bits of code, etc. All right, one thing that people get confused with you know, you go and you, you hook up some real fancy schmancy tool and you start testing all of your code. What most people don't understand is when you hook up that fancy schmancy, it's already going to slow your code down. That makes sense? You're already running something else. You're making the CPU do something it wouldn't be doing otherwise. All right? And by and large, when you're profiling and you really have to cut down, you may or may not be aware of this, but two places where, well, three places where your code is going to have bigger bottlenecks than any place else, all right? Number one is if you're working with files. File reads and file writes are notoriously slow. Going along with file reads and file writes are database reads and database writes, all right? So that's, that's two of them right there. And the other one is true exception handling with try catches because when you create a try catch block and it does the catch, it has to create a new object it's going to slow stuff down. So what he asks you to do in here, and I did this, I went out to Git, GitHub, and I installed this web grind tool. All right, so I downloaded it. And as, as he said, it came in a zip file that had to be expanded, did all the stuff that he said to do. I went to PHP any and made sure that it was turned on in there. Those are those lines. You may or may not have seen that before when I showed it to you. but I had to turn all these on. And what he tells you to do in here is not what they tell you to do out in the, you know, on Stack Overflow and actually out on, on their site. He had different flags here. The flag they used wasn't the percent %p. All right, it was a different one. But I tried his, and it seemed to work just fine, even though, again, it wasn't what was in the book. So and I, I not only had to turn that line of code on, as I showed you earlier, to turn on xdebug, I had to turn on these two lines as well, all right? So I went through all the stuff that was shown in here. And it says restart it, run any script to have, have xdebug profile it. The problem is the scripts that we have in this book are so doggone small, they didn't really show very much. Probably the biggest script that the author has in here is less than 100 lines. And he's not doing anything that's unbelievably heavy in here. All right. All right. And then the last thing that's discussed is on improving performance. Some interesting stuff in here. All right. Again, Jeff says it's interesting stuff. You may or may not agree. But this goes along with the stuff we talked about before about improving performance. It says, start by looking at two possible indicators of inefficiency, processes that take disproportionately more time than the other ones and ones that take more time than they should. Unless you have experience, this isn't going to make a whole heck of a lot of sense to you. All right? One of the things that I had to do, as an example, when I was at AT&T, 
we would go and take our code and, and hook it up to simulated call boxes where we could have anywhere from a call or two, you know, a call every minute or whatever, to thousands of calls a minute. Why did we want to do that? We wanted to make sure that the new code we were adding wasn't breaking what was already out there. All right. But after a while, what I learned was, okay, I'd run this, and I'd, I'd run it, and I'd simulate maybe a call a minute, and then, a, and then faster and faster and faster until we had several thousand calls going on at a time. And I'd have to go and check times to see how long things were taking. Then I would have to introduce my own code and run the same tests again to see how, you know, if, if I was disproportionately slowing things down. Does that make sense? Right. Because it's, if, if, it's a, if it's a new feature and it gives something, that, you know, gives people something they didn't have before, but it slows stuff down so it takes twice as long, then it's not a good feature. So he's, he says here, you should not focus on the specific amount of time it takes for them to re be required to execute. This is what I mentioned before. Because just profiling the script is going to slow it down. Period. Right? And then he starts, he gets into a little uh, offshoot here on the bottom of 473. And he talks about caching. And he talks about implementing server side caching. Most of us, when we think of caching, we think about it from the client side. But depending on the permissions that you have, server side caching can be important too. All right, he says there's several kinds that you can implement. You can cache the output of a script. All right, you can implement opcode caching. There's a lot of different stuff. Some of this stuff, when you're, when you're implementing opcode cache caching, says at runtime, when a user requests a page, the, the server must read the PHP code and compile it into another, into a binary format when it's executed. So there, you're, test, you're testing that, breaking stuff literally down to zeros and ones and seeing how much time it takes. All right, that's probably not something you as a, a quote, real programmer would do, but you'd have a test team that would have to do things like that. Depending on your database application, you might have query caching too. You will. Anything that you can do to make things run a little faster. You've heard me say this before. If I go out to Amazon and I want to buy something, all right, I'm hot to buy something. Well, once they've got me there and they, you know, I, I, I go and I put, start putting stuff in my cart. Amazon doesn't want it that when I say to check out that, I'm, that it's hung and it just sits there for five or, you know, three, four, five minutes. Why don't they want that? What am I going to do? I'm going to leave. And they have no guarantee I'm ever coming back. All right? So they're always going to be doing whatever they can, caching. It's just a way of optimizing. All right? So what he has you do, and I had some problems with this, so I didn't get as far on it as I wanted to, but I did load WebGrind into the browser. <coughs> In fact, I should be able to show you what I did. that starts it up. And what you have to do in here, and you have to know a lot more about it than I do. All right. There's a way to do this, and, and after this, you put in the name of a script. All right. And it'll run it through here. And it'll start showing you where you've got potential bottlenecks. All right. You need to have a lot more experience than this than your instructor. Because I used to do this stuff, but it's been 30 years. Gee, it's changed a bit. All right? But people do things like this because you want to go through, and especially if you've got something that's real-time sensitive. And I go back to the standard example I've given you for two years. Back when I worked for AT&T, you had rotary phones. You'd pick it up. If you didn't get a dial tone, most people within three seconds, they hung up. If it was a long-distance call, that meant the phone company was essentially losing money. You couldn't do that. So we were always doing something to try to make sure that you got dial tone as soon as possible. Right. So.
So he runs through that, and I think this is what he shows, some of the things that could be taking time and how much time they're taking. And that was it. Finally, the last thing he mentions here in this little box, this gray box on page 476, is, hey, he's just hitting the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more ways that you can test. There's a lot more tools that are out there. All right, plus, if I run all of these tools, this, I'll leave you with this, and this should make sense to you. If I'm developing an application and I'm doing all of my work within XAMPP, and I download Xdebug and everything else, and I test it up the wazoo, guess what? When I put it on a live server, I've got to run all those tests again. Because once I put it on a live server, now it's not just my traffic. It's potentially hundreds, thousands, millions of people traffic, too. So you got to run this same stuff all over again. All right? So that's it. That's all I'm covering in the book. What we're going to do, Thursday is going to be a lab in here because you've got that assignment. So if you didn't see it previously, you weren't here when I went over it, and you should have gotten an email on it too. It's your first assignment for this class as we start transitioning over, all right, into our homework. Very similar, similarly set up to what we did last semester in the Joomla class create a two to three page requirements document outlining what you're doing for your project. An overview of what, you, what your thing will be about, why you picked it, what you want to accomplish with it, etc. This may be a living document. You may need to make changes to it as you go on. I put a couple helpers in here and a YouTube video. And with that YouTube video, Kelly was telling me that he said, you know, I don't know if you, if you, how many of you were here when he said that. He goes, Jeff, you know that thing's over an hour long? And I didn't watch all of it. I just watched the beginning, and I thought it looked pretty good. So we went through nine last week. We just, so this has already been changed. It only took two days to go through Chapter 9, so we've already gone through Chapter 14. So this Thursday, two days from now, will be lab. All right? And as it says, from Tuesday, 224, so a week from today, through Thursday, 326, unless we get done earlier, we'll be working on the movies project. We are going to do that. All right. First, and I didn't know if this would be worthwhile or not. Remember how earlier in the book, um, I don't remember what chapter it was, but in, in an earlier chapter, we kind of wrote that simple blog. Remember that, that stuff that we looked at? It might have even been last semester. I don't remember. I'm in the middle of rewriting that using object-oriented PHP, just so you can see the difference, it won't look any different to the naked eye, but the code will be different between doing it with procedural PHP and object-oriented PHP. So if I get that done by Tuesday, we're going to do that next Tuesday. And then we'll start on that project on uh, Thursday. All right. So as it says, after we complete that movies project, and I'm going to give you the code, I'm just going to walk you through what, 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 what I did and what was kind of done for me. All right. And after that, the rest of the semester, so it'll be sometime, you know, all of April and those two weeks in May, all right, are going to be for you to work on the project. And as I've said before, you know, this is based on quality, not quantity. And you are going to be presenting these. It's the 17th, so it's less than three months from now. The 14th, I believe, is the last day we have class. Yep, that's going to be the day, between 10 and 12. I hope to have about a dozen people in here most of them external. These are people that you are parading around for, you know, and performing for, for lack of better words. I get up there. I don't introduce any of you. I get up there and say, we've got about eight students here today who are going to present their projects for you. You get up, and you introduce yourself, and it's your. The stage is basically yours for about 10 minutes. All right? That's all that I have.